Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be delving into the fallout of the infamous Carl death, and slowly moving into the final big events of All Out War. Similar to Season 7 and the start of this entire thing, here too we'll have some events which basically happened back to back in the comic but were substantially dragged out in the TV version. So don't be too surprised if some parts of the entire thing as we cover it here do feel a tad disjointed. That's just how the show adapted them. But without further ado, let us jump right in. When we last left off, we had just seen the reveal of Carl's fate, so that's exactly where we'll open with the mid-season premiere. If you want to hear all of my meta thoughts on that, all of that is in the previous Season 8 video. So here, I mostly just want to focus on the execution of it, rather than the implications of this entire deal. That said, we open with the teary eyes Rick, which, like I said last time, is just some great non-linear storytelling in my book, so big golden star for that. And of course, we also see Carl actually getting bit, which had been completely off-screen so far. But even seeing this, I do still think that we should have seen a little more of what happened, because to me, this is still pretty much akin to being just off-screens. Yeah, technically we do see the moment he's bit, but it's not like we really see the entire thing play out, right? Though, to be fair, he really was randomly stumbling around and got bitten as a result, so did we need to see that? I think that just says more about the story as a whole, if I'm being honest, but okay. And of course, there's plenty of more symbolism and callbacks here. Like him planting a tree, which I think needs no further clarification. Then there's the entire dichotomy of his last days, as unlike anyone we've ever seen before, he remains joyful as he writes all the letters and so on. There's also him talking about the dude he shot back at the prison, which you could take to be a parallel to him talking about Ben in the comics, and many many others which we won't delve into for the sake of time. It's just the same thing we've seen ever since episode 100, there are lots of callbacks and parallels in this season more than any other. But one thing I do definitely want to bring up is the performance from Andrew, Denai, and Chandler here, because oh boy, are these not some of the best acted scenes in the series. The way the whole thing plays out over the course of the episode is just absolutely brutal. Especially as we cut around to all the other attacks going on in tandem, and when we cut back, we progressively see Carl just burn out. And of course in retrospect, there's also some pretty messed up irony here as Carl's wish was to put an end to this war. But as he's literally dying, we just cut around to all the other battles. And obviously, the greatest sequence just has to be when they make it to the destroyed church. Because the moment Carl says that he needs to be put down, the way Andrew slips right back into that denial we've only ever seen with Lori is something else entirely. No! <laughs> no. No. In many ways, it is a much different reaction to Lori, but at the same time, it is exactly like it. If anything, this whole thing is even worse because he is literally watching his son die right in front of his eyes. Unlike Lori, where that entire thing was a surprise, here, he is just sitting by and he is helpless. There is not a single thing he can do anymore. And also, the cinematography here is also just excellent, as that last glimmer of light shines into the room. But even all of that, none of it stands up to the final scenes as we see Rick and Michonne stand outside. And the moment that shot goes off, they just both literally fall apart then and there. Not a single word is spoken in that scene, but the way we see both of them just crack is absolutely incredible. And to this day, it still punches me right in the gut. So to sum it all up, in terms of the story, I hate literally everything that happens here as much as anyone. But as per usual, Greg Nicotero knocked it out of the park with his direction, and everyone who was involved with the production side of this episode gets a big golden star. The writers who killed off Carl, on the other hand, well, we don't hand out consolation prizes, unfortunately. Still speaking about the TV show, the attack on the kingdom is also of course still going on. And while we won't delve into the nitty gritty of this entire thing as it's not entirely relevant for now, I do want to mention the whole Henry deal. Just like the attack as a whole, Henry is exclusive to the show, and his entire motivation for going after the saviors is also entirely written for the show since neither Benjamin nor Gavin exist in the books. Many readers at the time thought that he'd just be your call replacement, which in many ways he was, 
but we all know how that ended, so also not really. Though yeah, like I said last time, this whole attack is very much carried by Gavin for me, as we didn't really have this sort of savior archetype in the book. And exploring that here, even if he is killed by Henry moments after, was just super interesting. Following all of the immediate Carl fallout, similar to the book, Alexandria is essentially lost after Negan's siege. And so, Rick and Michonne leave to meet up with the trash folk. In the book, the whole leaving part was of course an organized effort and all of them went to the hilltop right away. Whereas in the show, it's quite a bit more chaotic, both because they don't head to the hilltop, but also because the characters are scattered all over the place already. Though another thing to note here is the structure of episode 10, as it follows a sort of a stories of format. Where instead of going through the episode as we normally do, we jump around between a few focal characters. In the grand scheme of things, it's of course nothing groundbreaking, but I do like the slightly different approach to the usual way of just cutting together various events, especially since in this case, many of them are not sequential, but rather play out mostly at the same time. So it also removes some potential confusion about how this entire war was just suddenly put on hold. Speaking of which, on Negan's side, by far the biggest deal here is the whole power struggle between him and Simon, who thinks that Negan's control is slipping. This is a plotline that will continue to prove throughout the rest of the season, but as he goes to address the betrayal of Jadis and the Trash Folk, history very much repeats itself as, just like with the Ocean side, they wipe out all of them. Clearly, since neither Jadis nor Simon exist in the book, all of this is TV show exclusive and, conveniently, removes a major part of some irrelevant people, so, you know, that's pretty cool, I guess introduce this middle faction who just plays both sides for the sake of drama and then all of them die. Hey, pretty good. Jokes aside, as far as characterizing Simon goes, I think this was essentially the final straw to show that if Negan were to suddenly disappear, a far more ruthless and unpredictable Simon would be there to take his place. Which just adds another nice layer of complexity to the whole conflict as a whole, and also answers the immediate question of why not just kill Negan and be done with it? Because if someone like Dwight were to just backstab Negan, well, Simon is there to take his place, and under him, things would get even dicier. And the final thing to note here, which we'd also see a few more times throughout the rest of the season, are the conversations with Negan over the walkie-talkies. Absolutely none of these happen in the book, neither about Carl, since he's obviously alive, or anything else for that matter. And to be honest with you, as much as I enjoy them from a hey Rick and Negan are throwing shade at each other perspective, I do think that these conversations were a tad too dramatized if that makes sense. Might just be a me thing, but them occasionally just chit-chatting like this did sort of take me out of the experience a little. I feel like in the book, a lot of what Negan was up to and his character as a whole was purposely hidden from us from time to time. Whereas here, again, they are just chit-chatting about random things. Obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, Negan has of course turned out to be a drastically different character in the TV version, and it almost seems like they're just trying to scoot his entire villainy under the rug at this point. But yeah, let's not get into that now, and basically all I wanted to say is that yes, Rick and Negan do chit-chat from time to time. Finally picking up the book, if you recall, after the siege on Alexandria, Negan captured Eugene, and that's exactly where we're at. He's thrown in a cell at the sanctuary. Here we basically see Dwight try to convince Eugene that he is in fact on their side and is working to get him out of here. While Eugene just fires back telling him that he'll kill him just like Dwight killed Abraham. As far as Eugene goes, it's really throughout All Out War that he becomes hardened in the book. Whereas in the show, I feel like his evolution was much more linear throughout the entire story. Which I think was just another good case of leveraging hindsight akin to making Maggie a leader earlier on. Though in story, while Dwight is talking, Dr. Carson walks in on them and overhears that Dwight is in fact double agents. Which, on the face of it, obviously seems like pretty bad news. Though he too then says that he wants to join up with them and escape. So in short, they are not the two only ones wanting to revolt against Negan and wanting to escape the sanctuary. As for the survivors, after they left Alexandria, all of them headed straight to the hilltop and also immediately started prepping defenses for Negan's inevitable attack. This entire regrouping at the hilltop deal was sort of remixed in the show, as there too we saw the kingdom's people head there and Rick too would join up with them a little bit later on, but it's also quite a bit different all things considered. In the book, it was more a case of let's consolidate all of our forces and start planning a massive counterattack. Whereas in the show, I always felt like it was more so a fallback location rather than a strategic one. So while in both versions, hilltop is a vital location, 
I do think that the purpose of it does differ quite a bit. And just a few more minor things to catch up on, we see that Heath has managed to pull through after getting his leg blown off and is making a steady recovery. And also, we see Rick talk to Earl, asking if he can whip something up for his missing hand. Something we would very much see post time skip. In the show, the whole rebellion of Eugene within the Sanctuary is also very heavily remixed, as he is not a prisoner, but rather an insider. In the show, it is Gabriel who's the captured one, and there too, Carson, just not that Carson, the other Carson, wants to escape with him. With the benefit of hindsight, obviously this whole storyline turns out to be massively important for Gabriel, considering just how big of a role he has in the final seasons of the show. And him losing his vision is also an actually permanent consequence of this entire ordeal. Though we'll talk about Gabriel in just a bit, so hold that thought for a second. Another remix for the show is most of what happens surrounding Dwight. In the book, as we've talked about before, he basically hid among the saviors the whole way through to the point that occasionally you'd have a hard time actually predicting on which side he falls. Whereas in the show, he straight up occasionally meets up with the survivors throughout the war. Broadly speaking, it doesn't really change much in how the war actually plays out, but I do think that this difference in the characterization of Dwight would be super important later on. Obviously, in the show it doesn't mean anything at all because he is pushed over to fear, insert obligatory fear reboot rant here, but in the book, this two-faced nature of his would of course play into the story all the way to the very very end. So it's just something to keep in mind if you haven't read the books yourself. All of these subtle differences do add up, and the way I at least perceive Dwight does differ quite substantially between the two versions. Returning to Gabriel though, their entire escape plan fails and he is just reassigned to work alongside Eugene where, surprise surprise, bullets are finally back on the menu. I've already talked about the importance of ammunition and the infinite ammo cheats to death already so I won't rehash all of that again. But yeah, in the show it is conveniently brought back up to set up the final battle which we'll talk about plenty more when we actually get there. As far as Gabriel goes though, I've gotta be honest, the whole escaping subplot does feel quite odd considering he just gets caught anyway. But I suppose Gabriel at least got some solid development out of it, so if that was the goal of this entire deal, fair enough I guess. Meanwhile on Negan's side, he too addresses his people and it's here where a huge turning point in the war happens. As we already saw with the siege on Alexandria, at this point, all bets are off and Negan just wants to hurt the survivors so much that they just fall back in line out of sheer desperation. And to achieve this, he has come up with a plan of gunking up their weapons with walker guts, basically making them effectively 100% lethal poison. This is adapted basically one for one, and in the show too, the saviors cover their weapons in walker guts to create these sorts of ticking time bombs within the group. This is one of those things in All Out War that I absolutely loved and was really surprised that it's the first time we'd see anything like that to be honest. Especially on initial reading, I still remember thinking, oh boy, Negan's playing very very dirty, what can the survivors even do at this point? Because yeah, one hit from these weapons and you're a walking bio weapon waiting to go off. You know, could have been a cool thing to explore if you were to follow a group of villains in a Walking Dead spin-off. Huh. And returning to the book for a second, as I briefly mentioned before, the survivors are consolidating all of their forces at Hilltop. So all of Alexandria and the Kingdom are now based there. And importantly, Rick already begins talking about backup plans in case the Hilltop falls. So we already have a few more locations to regroup in case the worst happens. These do just turn out to be red herrings though, so it's mostly just a throwaway line for the sake of realism. As for the show, the story does briefly converge back to the comic as there too we see most of the joint forces regroup at the hilltop. Though the thing I want to mention here specifically is the brief conversation between Rick and Daryl following Carl's death, because once again, oh boy. Big surprise, Norman and Andrew kick it out of the park here. And for the 100th time, as much as I hate Carl's death, he does give us some incredibly interesting character dynamics with Rick here as he begins to slip back into that brutal and cold leader we hadn't seen since season 3 in the prison. And the scene I feel encompasses all of that is when they're talking about splitting up for the upcoming mission. We're covering as much ground as we can. Alright. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm gonna be okay. Clearly, Rick is trying to push aside everything that happened with Carl and just focus on the immediate happenings. And that worries Daryl. 
Because just trying to push aside everything that has happened and just going head first into battle is going to get him killed. So that sudden break in the conversation where Rick just tries convincing him that he is okay is so, so raw and real. The dialogue here is just beautifully written and acted out to perfection. In the show, ever since we got to Alexandria and the cast quickly ballooned, the whole brother vibe between Daryl and Rick had faded. And it seems like these that very neatly remind us of all the stuff they've been through. So yep, yeah, hats off to everyone involved with the sequence and a wonderful addition to the show, all things considered. What's not a wonderful addition is what happens on Maggie's side. And that is the appearance of Georgie, who frankly makes literally zero sense whatsoever. Like, I'm sorry, I could do mental gymnastics and try to explain how and why she's important, how these random encounters might happen in the world and that this is just world building and all of that, but I am sorry, literally everything about her is a dude, trust me type of writing that contributes nothing to the story aside from conveniently moving Maggie in and out of the series. Like, you know, figuring out how to restart civilization should be the biggest goal of the survivors, right? Yeah, well, actually, no. Here is a big book of plot that I call The Key to help you along. Wait, what? Maggie's now going to go off with her for a while? Okay, so bye-bye, I guess? Oh, Maggie's back now? So where's Georgie? Oh, your community was attacked and she's just gone? Isn't that convenient, but okay, I guess that's sad. Should I feel bad about it? I didn't know any of them, but okay, if you say so. I seriously hate to be nitpicking, but there seriously is not a single thing about her that feels like good storytelling, and similar to a lot of the CRM story, feels so crowbarred in because AMC saw the money pile that is the expanded MCU and thought, hey, how about we do that too? Who cares that it doesn't make literally any sense whatsoever? Just write them in. Hello, editing Kuroto jumping in. While I was working on this video, the last episode went out, and a whole bunch of you told me that you just completely forgotten that the RPG sequence with Rosita existed and thought that I'd actually made it up. So, out of curiosity, how many of you had honestly forgotten that Georgie ever existed? Do let me know, because if I still didn't think it was the goofiest thing to ever happen in Season 8, I would probably forget about it too. Anyway, I'm not even going to talk about Georgie again, so let's just move on from that and back to the video. Returning to Rick, we see another major change for the show, and that is the whole convoy Negan has and Rick attacking them. And before I continue, you might be noticing a trend here. Almost exactly like Season 7, the comic storyline is much more straightforward and there really aren't these prolonged bits of downtime which allow for these, let's be honest, pretty hard to believe scenarios to happen. We just go big battle to big battle and we don't have these random one-on-ones in between. But anyway, as far as the Negan vs Rick deal goes, I have to admit, as much as it is the most over-the-top thing I've ever seen, I mean, look at it, Rick is straight up fulfilling the Azora High prophecy, but I can't lie, this is one of my favorite things in the latter half of the season. I mean, yeah, each and every one of us knew perfectly well that nothing would happen here, it's not episode 189 or 16 after all, but still, the fight was a ton of fun to see on initial viewing, and was only made better since because I am still looking at every bit of the walking that that still has Rick with some pretty rose-tinted glasses. Though while the prophetic and almost biblical battle is going on between Rick and Negan, trouble is brewing among the saviors as well, most notably Simon starting to make moves to usurp Negan. I've said it many many times and I'll say it again, Simon, or the much more appropriately named Trevor, is by miles my favorite addition to the Negan saga in the TV universe, so big surprise. I absolutely loved all the drama that came out of this, both from Dwight's perspective who too is going against Negan but through drastically different means, as well as from the rest of the saviors who just straight up fear Simon because of how ruthless he can be. Returning to the book for a bit, like I said, the story is much more straightforward and there are no extra confrontations in between the Siege of Alexandria and what comes next. And so we just cut to Negan who was already looking over the hilltop and announcing that they attack at sundown. And just like with season 7, buckle up TV only folks. Because in the book, this is essentially the final battle of All Out War, whereas in the show, this is only episode 13. And the final battle would take place on the most strategic battlefield of all time. A literal open field. And before we get to that, we still have a few more things to cover in the books. One of which being Carson and Eugene in the Sanctuary. Here, we basically see a smaller version of what we've already seen in the show about various saviors revolting against Negan. 
because after Carson frees Eugene, there is a small band of people who too wish to flee the Sanctuary and Negan. Though yeah, they basically gear up to escape while most of Negan's forces are preparing to siege the hilltop. And before we move on, I once again want to take a very quick pit stop to talk about the pacing here. Because like I just said, we are on episode 13, so 4 episodes deep into the second half of season 8. Whereas in the comic, we've only covered issue 122 and a couple of pages of 123. So I think that should give you a pretty good idea of just how much snappier the book is about this whole war. And to me, that is also a big part of what makes it feel far more real in the book because there really is no room to breathe. Issue 121 is Alexandria getting absolutely bombarded by grenades. Issue 122 is about the survivors regrouping, but by the end of it, Negan has already announced his next plan. And issue 123 is just that, the saviors attacking the hilltop. In my opinion, the TV series got a little too caught up with the personal quabbles and the bigger war just felt very disjointed as a result. Whereas the book uses these super personal moments extremely sparingly. And as the title of the volume suggests, it's the all-out war that takes front stage. As to which version you prefer is up to you, but if you're not familiar with the source material, just know that, compared to the show, it moves at a ludicrous speed. Anyway, returning to the story, another small scene we get in the comic is between Carl and Sophia. They've of course been living in different communities for a while now, so Sophia walks up to him asking if he remembers her. But Carl fires back asking, Of course I remember you. You think I'm going to be all weird and try to convince myself I don't remember you so I won't miss you? Sophia then calls him mean and even though Carl tries apologizing, she just walks off saying that she'll just go to eat with her other friends. Obviously, this whole exchange is just a couple of angsty kids not really knowing how to talk to each other, but what I think is the most interesting thing here is Carl and how he just sits as a loner. As we've talked about plenty before already, Carl has basically always been far far darker in the book, so this shouldn't really come as a surprise. I'd even go as far as to say that in many ways he resembles Daryl in the show in the early days. But in terms of his story, this whole loner vibe and not really knowing anyone at the hilltop would be super important later on, so keep that in mind for later down the line. Though cutting to Rick, we see a brief conversation between him and Andrea as they're sharing a meal. Rick talks about how after they've beaten Negan, they'll have to get Alexandria back into working condition, to which Andrea responds by simply smiling. Picking up on her reaction, Rick then asks, What, you don't believe me? But she says that, no, it's just that she's taken aback by his optimism and that it's very reassuring. And we then see Rick turn his head and say, I just don't see how Negan ever defeats this. Obviously, compared to the show, Rick is in a drastically different state of mind at this point, and despite Alexandria being basically burned to the ground, Rick is almost even happier to see the unity of their communities, and that the Battle of Alexandria wasn't a complete tragedy since Maggie's people drove Negan away. So in many ways, similar to him arriving at Alexandria and then at the hilltop, this is just Rick peering into the future for a minute. And no matter how much tragedy there is surrounding that, Rick has always seen the bigger picture. No matter what happens, he sees the long game. We'll be talking plenty more about this dichotomy of Rick in the two versions after Negan is defeated, so that's where I'll leave that for now. And of course, this is The Walking Dead after all, so it's definitely not all sunshine and rainbows because just as we see this hopeful Rick, we see the guards yell out that Negan is already here. And with that, the final major battle of All Out War begins. We cut to Cal and the saviors at the gates, where Cal is screaming for everyone to get ready. Negan then just asks for Rick, to which Cal responds by saying that he needs to talk to him now, only for Negan to just signal for him to be shot. Negan then once again calls for Rick, but he is met with another, he's not here and I don't even know what you're talking about, after which he becomes very visibly annoyed, tells Dwight to make sure his arrows, oh I mean bolts, are covered with walker guts and then gives one last warning telling everyone within the walls to bow down and not move a muscle or they'll be killed on the spot. And as Negan tells his people to take it down, a cargo truck goes right through Hilltop's gates. But for a moment, nothing happens, even making Negan question what's going on. But just as suddenly, that silence is broken as the joint forces all open fire on the truck and basically rip it to shreds. 
And here we see something very exotic compared to the show's final confrontation. Strategy. Because, you know, they create a choke point and reinforce it with everything they have. Unlike the show where we were on a field with hundreds if not thousands of people in the open with automatic weapons. Yeah. Anyway, in as few words as possible, Hilltop is thrown into absolute chaos and it quickly becomes a battleground. Andrea is picking off the cars and drivers one by one while Negan's forces are trying to break through their defenses. At this point, basically all bets are off and Negan just plans to crush them and those who remain will be so broken that their only real chance is to fall back into line. And right away, we see the saviors using hand-to-hand -hand weapons, which we of course know to be infected. So they basically become Chekhov's walkers just waiting to go off. And importantly, we see Rick standing right in front of Negan, where he turns to Dwight and tells him to shoot him with an infected bolt, saying that even if it's not a kill shot, he's done. And while Dwight does waver for just a moment, the next panel is Rick getting skewered and with that, Negan proclaims that he's as good as dead and that without him, they're nothing. Game over. And oh boy, if you were a part of the community back then, you probably remember all the discussions this sparked. Because did we seriously just watch Rick essentially be doomed to turn? Yes, this is Dwight who so far has played on Rick's side whenever possible. But he also never warned them about Alexandria in the first place, and what about that panel of him wavering? Does he not want to shoot Rick? Or was that panel to show us that he's stuck between a rock and a hard place and he has no other choice? Though on the flip side again, he also talked about not modifying the weight of the bolts with the guts. So was he deliberately prepping clean bolts? I think at this point, most people were already expecting The Walking Dead to ultimately be Carl's story. So was this Kirkman just finishing off the Grimes family in the most brutal way possible? and forcing Carl to watch on as his father just burned out? And what about that moment of Rick's optimism? Was that just some bitter irony from Kirkman? Point is, discussion was absolutely set ablaze here, and to this day, it remains as one of the biggest oh no moments in the story for me. Oh, and also, Rick's right hand briefly regrows here, but don't worry about that too much, it's totally fine. Jokes aside, before we follow up with the hilltop, we briefly cut to Eugene, Carson and the others who are still escaping from the sanctuary. By the time we check in with them, night has already fallen and similar to the show and Gabriel's escape, they run into a whole bunch of walkers. But things are a little more complicated here because aside from the walkers, one of Negan's lookouts also spot them. And here we see another one of Eugene's cheeky moves, because he says that they can get out of this if they just listen to him. And we then cut to Donnie, the savior lookout, who, thinking that they're just using the walkers as protection, says that they can press the horn as long as they want. The walkers aren't going anywhere and they'll just simply starve in there. But we then cut to the car, which has like a hammer or something jammed in between the seat and the horn. And we then see Eugene and the others already behind Donnie. Eugene pushes him over the edge and with that, Donnie is no more. As far as Eugene goes, as I mentioned before about All Out War hardening Eugene, this is the first person he has ever killed, so we also briefly linger on him just dealing with what he's done. Returning to the hilltop though, night has now fallen and Negan continues pushing forwards. And in the meantime, everyone is just trying to escort Rick back to the Barrington house and everyone is also perfectly aware that it was Dwight who shot him since no one else uses bolts. And we also see a whole bunch more people slashed by the gunked up weapons, but with Carl's help at the doors, Rick does ultimately make it inside. And it's then that Negan tries to begin one last push to just wipe out everything that remains of the hilltop. Only for massive floodlights to suddenly blind them, and the joint forces to open fire from the windows. Keep in mind that Negan's still largely unsure who is actually within the hilltop since in the book, he doesn't have lieutenants managing each community separately as he does in the show. So them being completely caught off guard by the hilltop's forces here is a massive turning point in the battle. And after realizing that they are just absolutely being torn to shreds here, Negan calls for everyone to fall back. And with that, we zoom out to see the hilltop ravaged by the attack, with the walkers Negan brought with him now two stumbling around within the walls. But despite the devastation, the joint forces and hilltop withstood the attack. And that is also where we'll leave it for today, as we've still got a ton of TV stuff to catch up on before we move any further. 
basically, the big takeaway here is that the comic has fewer battles, but all of them are much, much more important, and all represent huge turning points in the story. We don't see any of these one-on-one -on -one fights or Azora High prophecies, and the battle for Hilltop is essentially the final one in the war, after which the comic story would take another major turn compared to the show. So, with all that said, as much as I hope to wrap up the season today, there is still a ton to talk about in the final act, so I hope to see you next time as we finally put an end to All Out War. And that's the video. Well, one more in Season 8, and I will think we'll wrap this whole thing up. Can't believe we're already this close to Andrew's exit. Seriously feels like just yesterday I started this entire series. And while I still have you, I'm fundraising as a part of Jingle Jam this year, so if you wish to get in your good deed in just in time for Christmas, consider donating to 12 wonderful charities through the link below. Donations of £35 and up, that is roughly €40.42, get a absolutely massive collection of some great games worth well over $1,000. All the details for that are linked below. Though with that, I also want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye